going to send them off. Uh, and uh, you can look forward to that. And uh, I, I would start humming the Eye of the Tiger theme, but I can't. So, uh, kids, this is your moment. You can head off to our Energy Kids program. Uh, just double checking that uh, Mornington are, are with us. Uh, yeah, Mornington are with us, that's helpful. Yeah, that's <laughs> doing well so far, aren't we? Uh, Lena Valley. Lena Valley are with us. Uh, morning to everybody, Lena Valley. Good to have you with us this morning. Just uh, quickly before I dive in, I wanted to share with you uh, about uh, four weeks ago, I, uh, we had uh, an accountant come in and, and, and let us know as a church family that uh, we were facing a, a difficult spot. And, I, and as part of that, I had a legal responsibility to let you know about that. Uh, it was interesting, I, I processed it and, and prayed about it. Uh, it was encouraging to hear uh, people's responses. Uh, but for me, my heart is no one should ever give to the church out of guilt or because the church needs something. But fundamentally, the, the message uh, we're wanting as a church family is say we're, it's all about trusting Jesus and, and I, being willing to trust him with our finances. Anyway, after that service, I had a, an older guy come in. I hasn't, I haven't seen, he's come a couple of times since. I haven't seen him. But he came in and, he, and, he, and he, it was after the service, after the time I shared with you. He came in and said, look, I've been watching that Chuck Swindoll fella on TV and I'm in. Uh, I, I just wanted to do my bit. And, and he gave me 50 bucks and then walked out again before I could say anything. Uh, it was in interesting. It was like God saying, it's okay, mate, we've got this covered. And, and uh, I just want to share with you that uh, the, we've had the biggest uh, turnaround in our finances. That it, so anyway, you'll see in, in your bulletin, we have a, like a weekly offering update thing to say, keep you in touch, touch with that. And our finances are fine, which is, uh, feels miraculous and, and feels too easy. But I think, I think what, what's encouraging for me is it's... It, it represents people saying, okay, Jesus, what are you saying to me? And that's always got to be it. it. This church, we never, ever want you to give out of guilt. Ever. It always has to be about, okay, God, what are you doing? And that's what it, and that's what it has to be about. Speaking of which, uh, it's, uh, we're now coming to the, the pointy end of the, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, and if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9. If you've got a device that you use to read the Bible on, uh, the Version app has the notes uh, for today's service. You just click on events and it'll they'll pop up, or else you can get the link to it from our uh, Facebook page. And uh, what has happened so far in the book of Ecclesiastes is uh, the, the author, who we assume is Solomon... Uh, there's debate about that, but we're assuming it's Solomon, uh, uh, has been dismantling all the different ways you can do life. And uh, he comes towards the end, he says, look, all those things don't work, but there are some truths we have to face. And I, I'm, I was fascinated reading today's paper, uh, the article in the Mercury today, uh, about our university students. This is the, the headline here. I don't know if you can, it's even possible to zoom in with the camera on that for the crew at um, uh, Atlanta Valley or on Facebook. Uh, kids' stress levels rise is the, the heading. And uh, the, the number of university students in particular who are suffering significant stress is, is significantly rising. And you can understand it. We live in a world that is so rapidly changing and all the answers we thought were answers don't seem to be answers anymore. And when we do think we've got answers, there's somebody else who's telling us we're wrong. And, uh, and, and how do you find your bearings in a world like that? And in many ways, that is the core question of the book of Ecclesiastes. How do you find your bearings in life? And uh, the difficult thing about Ecclesiastes, and one of the reasons why the philosopher Peter Kreeft says everybody should read it as lesson one, is that it strips away all the things that we tend to rely on. He, he says the book of Ecclesiastes is lesson one, and the rest of the Bible is lesson two, and that the people don't heed lesson two because they haven't realised lesson one. So let's dive in to verse one. 
So I reflected, oh, this is of chapter 9, Ecclesiastes, verse 1. I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits, love or hate awaits them. Do you know, this is a theme of the book of Ecclesiastes, do you know that your life is in God's hands? One of the confronting and difficult things about this book is it points out all the things that aren't going to work to try and put your hands in other things. He's, he's pointing out the power, no matter how powerful you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how smart you are, that is not going to sort your life out for you. He starts this chapter by saying, the only sane point to approach life is knowing that your life is in God's hands. He then goes on and he points out truths that many of us want to not think about too much. And I, you know, I've, it's interesting, I went to the, the Baptist seminary or training institution in Canada and it's interesting, a lot of training schools for pastors are having to face the reality that uh, what the church we are training people to lead is no longer what the church is. Similarly, as university students go into university, the things they are learning are not preparing them for the world as it is. I remember a long time ago, my dad, I think it was in the mid-80s, my dad was saying that when my son grows up, one third of the jobs that will be available to him have not yet been invented. And I remember thinking, no, that's a bit of an overstatement. Before we had the internet, before we had iPhones, before, you know, he, he was right, and I think he was probably conservative. And the pace of change is dramatically increasing. And one of the dangers, I think, for us is that we can, even at church, be preparing people to answer questions that are no longer the questions that people have. What does it mean to face the long, hard, complicated reality of what life actually is? And I think that's what Solomon's doing as he dives in and says, let's face the truth. We're all going to die. All of us share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not as it is with the good, so with the sinful, and, and with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes us all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterwards they join the dead. Is, can you identify that? This is what the, the Apostle Paul later would say, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's the stuff I keep on doing. He's saying, look, we, we get one shot at it, Solomon's saying, then we die. And while we're alive, there's madness in our hearts. There's stuff that we can't even understand. We don't even understand ourselves. Sometimes we do just stupid stuff. Can you identify with that? Apart from trusting God... This, this is a, a fundamental truth that most of us want to escape. But nobody does. Ultimately, most of us spend much of our lives running away from the truth that ultimately our lives are going to come to an end. There is going to be a day where the sun rises and you don't. And it's interesting, this past week we heard that a, a guy who was known as Australia's foremost atheist and former leader of the Labor Party, Bill Hayden, has just come to faith as he approaches the reality of death. Ultimately, what Solomon's saying, death is a great equaliser and no matter what, how, what ideas, what words you come up with, we all face it. He goes on and says, uh, anybody, anyone who is among the living has hope, even a dog a live dog is better off than a dead lion, for the living know that they will die. 
but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. If you want to live in a world without God, Solomon's saying, here is an uncomfortable truth you have to face. And we have to face it. It's interesting, there's a, a whole lot of debate at the moment about the closure of Anglican churches. Uh, and as part of that, the, the, uh, the graves of the people. The, and and I, I think we're having to have a conversation as a community about the difference between the civic history of our church and the responsibility of the local church. Um, that's a whole other discussion I'll be keen to talk about further as we uh, support our brothers and sisters in the Anglican church. But... Um, but there is a truth. One of the, one of the graves that is at risk at the moment is the, the grave of the, the first ever Tasmanian-born Premier. Who knows his name? Isn't that interesting? No, it wasn't Lyons. It's in the newspaper today. You can do some research. I can't remember what it is. And, that, and that's kind of... <laughs> That's, 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 that's telling you what Solomon's saying. Ultimately, there's going to be a day where people don't even remember you were around. It's an uncomfortable truth. But we need to face it. This is the exact opposite of Christian hope. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is is gain. In a life without God, death is the scary specter that you spend your life avoiding. In a life in and around Jesus Christ, there is a hope that we point to. So Solomon says, and, he go, and, and, and I, I'm going to spend some more time as a church. I'd love to, to take a couple of months at some point just really unpacking the, the biblical vision of heaven. Because I think most of us have a vision of what's going to happen when we die that's more based on science fiction than, than on the Bible. And I'd, I'd love to... And, and, the, and often the Christian imagination actually uh, was more informed by a fellow called Dante in his book, The Inferno, than it was by, by the Bible. We're looking forward to having a, that conversation at some point. Um, because what you think happens after you die affects how you live now. It's an important conversation. Solomon goes on and he says, go. Like with all, if this is true, go, go eat your food with gladness. This is a theme right the way through the book. Drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. He's saying, don't spend your life worrying about tomorrow. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what Jesus was saying. Be in this moment now with God. And it's interesting, he uses the reference always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. That is a picture of always being fresh and ready for the moment. It is also a picture of being clothed in white is a picture of innocence and forgiveness. Jesus actually uses the same language in the book of Revelation. Revelation uh, 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Ultimately, it is only Jesus who can provide what we need for our whole life. Ultimately, it is only Jesus who can provide what we need for our whole life. But what Solomon is calling us to do is to do what every spiritual tradition says is the sign of maturity. So living in the moment, being present to the moment, not spending your life worrying about what will happen or what has happened, but be in this moment now, he's saying. He goes on and says, enjoy life with your wife. I do. 
she's pretty good. <laughs> but, it, but he's not saying uh, you must have a wife to enjoy life. He's saying, no, enjoy, the, enjoy your family relationships. Enjoy the relationships you're part of. Don't spend your life worrying about what you don't have. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life. And again, we don't have a word that translates meaningless well. It's the, the Hebrew word hevel, and it means, more, more means vapour. It means that you think you're the centre of the universe. Your life is kind of here, permanent. And so it's saying your life is like vapour. And you need to understand the book of Ecclesiastes is calling us to humility, to having a right view of our life before God. He's saying, for this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labour under the sun, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Throw yourself into life. There is work for you to do. You are not here to take up space. No matter how old you are, whether you're one of our kids who run around here and there is actually a job for our kids to be doing in life and that is, you know, being a kid and growing. Their job is to be in the moment and to be them. But your job is to be you and your job is to throw yourself into the life that God has for you today, this afternoon. Not spend your life somewhere else, is what he's saying. It's, and, from, and, and this is Solomon, this is trying, I was saying, without a God, once you get to the realm of the dead, it's, it's, it's done and dusted, is what he's saying. He goes on, he says, look, let, let's face some other uncomfortable truths of life. I've seen something else under the sun in uh, verse 11. The race isn't always to the fastest person or the battle to the strongest person. Nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favour to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when the hour will come, or as fish are caught in a cruel net, birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. What's he saying? He's saying, yeah, generally speaking, the, the strongest person will win the, the battle, the smartest person will get the best marks, often, but often it doesn't. Life doesn't always conform to the pattern you think it should, is what he's saying. Time and chance happen to us all. One of the uncomfortable truths that he keeps coming back to in this book is that bad things happen to good people. And if you have a simplistic wish fulfilment kind of faith that says, Jesus is my godmother, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Because the moment things don't go the way your ego wants them to do, your, go, go, your faith is going to you know, go out the window. Jesus is not your godmother, your fairy godmother. He is your path to life. And he promises to be with us through all the ups and downs of life, not save them, save us from the ups and downs of life. And so Solomon's saying, look, Let's be honest, life has ups and downs and it doesn't always make sense. He goes on, just in case you're thinking, you know, well, that's, you know, that's only that example. He goes on and says, look, I also saw under the sun uh, this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once, this is verse 13, a, a, a small city with a few people in it and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered the poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. What's he saying? That one of the themes of the book is the best way to approach life 
is clearly wisdom. And what is wisdom in the Hebrew sense? It is living in the real world, seeing the world as God sees it. That's what wisdom is. In, in the, the, what the, it's not just about in IQ. It's about being function, functional in reality. Not avoiding things, not being stuck in your head, but being functional in related, relation to the real world because you are living in the real world, not in some fantasy world. You are living in reality as God sees it. That's what wisdom is. But he points out time, chance, and it's interesting, he says, the sin of others still happen to us all. Even a wise person, even though wisdom is no guarantee of things going the way your ego wants them to go. It is the best way to do stuff and, and often a wise person will be able to navigate their way against you know, powerful people who are coming with evil agendas. Absolutely. But just being wise is no guarantee that things are going to go the way you want them to go. Is you know, that's what Solomon's saying. He's saying, look, let's, let's be honest here. He goes on. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honour. And we all know this to be true. We all look back in our lives in little and big ways and see we are not as free as we might have been had we not made some of the choices we've made in our lives. Isn't that true? And we see it writ large as ministries full, as people who have, like, you know, a fellow like Bill Hybels who's done so much, had so much, but a, a little folly pulls it all apart, if you know what I mean. Like, it, this is part of the, the, the reality of life. The messes of your life stay with you. Uh, and, and affect you. Now, one of, the th- one of the things I love about our Bible is we follow a God of grace who says all things somehow work together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his plan. Or as Bono in U2 says, <laughs> grace finds beauty in ugly things. If we're to be honest, all of us have ugly things that we're not proud of. But if we're hanging on to God, somehow he's able to turn that into good. But Solomon is saying, let's face it, the ugly stuff creates a mess. Now, this next one has been used uh, by conservative politicians inappropriately. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10.2 says, the heart of the wise inclines to the right, uh, but the heart of the fool to the left. Uh, 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 in Hebrew idiom, uh, the the left is 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 thought to be foolish. Just you know, it's, it's kind of saying that that and and it's thought to be like self-centered, ignorant. You know, choices is kind of what the the left is thought to be. It's 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 that's what it. In Hebrew idiom, it doesn't, it's not actually the Labour Party, just in case you're wondering. Uh, um, even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. Is kind of, um, wise choices are, are likely to lead to good outcomes. What someone said. Yeah, look, wise choices are likely to lead to good outcomes and foolish choices are likely to lead to pain. But he's already said that if you're going to hang your hat on that, you're going to be disappointed. Don't... Don't, don't assume that's going to be true, is what is our theme. He says, sometimes a ruler's anger, in verse 4, might rise against you. Someone in authority might get annoyed with you, is what he's saying. He's saying, don't leave your post. Calm, don't get stuck in the drama, he's saying. Calmness can lay great offence to rest. Now, again, this is one that's been misunderstood. There is an evil I've seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from someone in authority. 
Fools are put in many high positions while the rich occupy the low ones. I've seen slaves on horseback while princes go, go on like slaves. Here, again, in Hebrew idiom and understanding, uh, rich, a rich person here is somebody who is more functional in life because they've been able to navigate and, and, and end up with wealth, whereas someone who is a slave is someone who is uneducated and dumb. Is, is kind of, in, in Hebrew idiom, is kind of what he's saying. So what, what he's actually saying uh, is that people, and you know this, people are not always put in positions of authority because they're the right person for the job. Have you noticed that? Uh, and he's also saying it's important not to react to people in authority. He goes on, he says, Look, this, let's, let's be honest, he says, uh, whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stone may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. No matter what you set, no matter what strategy you set about trying to, you know, sort your life out by to earn an income with or whatever, no strategy for life is guaranteed to work. No strategy for life is guaranteed to work, you say. The very thing you think you're building a life on may actually be the thing that undoes you, is what he's saying. He goes and says, if the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, in, in verse 10, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Sometimes it's a good idea to sharpen the axe, he's saying. Like, sometimes it's a good idea to you know, think before you start acting. He, in fact, he goes on and says, if a snake bites before it's charmed, the charmer receives no fee. All the skill in the world is useless unless you do something with it, is what he's saying. And, and one, of the, one of the dangers we can have in life, we can, we can look for the, the talented, the beautiful people, the, the, the people that seem to, where all the chips go in their, their way. And, and what Solomon's saying, look, it's not to do with how smart you are, you, were bo you know, or what gifts you were born with, it's what you do with it that counts. Do, you've got to do the hard, do the hard yards. Just because you're born with a certain aptitude doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. You've got to do something with the gifts that God's given you. And he goes on, he says, and, and this is, I, I think this is particularly part of what we need to hear right now. Someone pointed out that um, the, it's interesting that no Prime Minister has survived a full term in Australia since Twitter was invented. We are surrounded by people with opinions. We are surrounded... You... There, we are surrounded by voices all telling us what reality is, all trying to make sense of life. You turn on the TV, and it, like, I find it quite entertaining. Flick, now we all get Sky News, you know, for free. Flicking between that and ABC, and it's like, wow, there's two different worlds we're living in here. It's useful. Like, I, I actually quite find it helpful to have different points of view coming, rather than getting stuck. And, but what he says is, Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious. Interesting. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious. But fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. And at the end, they're wicked madness. And fools multiply words. No one actually knows what's coming, he's saying. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? It's amazing how many people are so definite about how the world works on social media. Have you noticed that? But how few actually have a clue. One of the, I think one of the great challenges that face us is we need to learn 
who are the, the gracious, wise people to actually listen to? And who are the fools who just enjoy the sound of their own voice? More than ever, we need to develop the ability to separate the words we give weight to and the words we don't. And fundamentally, there is only going to be one person who won't let you down. And you'll find his words in the Gospels. It's interesting. I, 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 I'm fascinated that often... You know, the people who have the strongest opinions live in a very simple, simplistic world where there's sort of one right way of seeing things. The world is much more complex than simple cliches can ever <coughs> capture or make sense of. But the contrast to that is often the most profound truths can be captured in a very simple way. Albert Einstein once said, you don't really understand something until you can describe it on the back of a napkin to the waitress who's serving you a cup of coffee. And I... I I think we need to be able, some of the most complex and profound truths of our faith, we need to wrestle with, rather than come up with simplistic cliches and bumper stickers. But ultimately, as we do, we will discover that some of the most profound and important truths of our lives are, are actually fairly simple. But they're a deep simple, not a shallow simple. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. What I, I find interesting about that is I think too often we had ch in church have prepared people with simple answers to simple questions that actually nobody's asking and so they'll hit a university where they discover the world's more complicated than we're preparing them for and, and things blow apart. I, I think Solomon is inviting us and to step into the real mess of life. And I think if we want to be real people of faith, if we want to be Jesus followers... It's interesting, he was always toughest on people who just lived in their religious ideas and didn't live out their faith in the mess of real life and the complexity of real life. And that same Jesus of Nazareth comes to us and he says, you know what? Yeah, life is messy. It is confusing and you are not going to sort it out on your own. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him, is what he said. As we allow ourselves to, to look into the eyes of the carpenter that walked the shores of Galilee and now sits at the right hand of the father, we find ourselves discovering truth. We find our bearings in a world that makes no sense. He is the sense of a world that makes no sense without him. I am so grateful for Solomon taking, having the guts to say, let's, let's be honest about how the world works. But I, I'm also grateful that I live in an era 
where Jesus has come and pointed the way to hope. Solomon only had glimpses of what was to come and was pointing to what was to come and was saying, look, the, the, the meaning of life can be found in walking in the moment with God. And Jesus came and said, let me show you how to do that. Let me send you. And as I do, let me release the Holy Spirit in you and amongst you because of what I've done on the cross. So you don't have to do this life on your own anymore. Let's just pray. Yeah, Jesus, we know life is, life is sometimes so confusing. We know for each one of us there are things that just don't make sense and we, 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 we try and be faithful, then we, you know, find ourselves falling apart. Thank you so much that as we turn our eyes again to you, the things of earth do grow dim as we turn our eyes upon you. And we look into your truth, your way, your life. Jesus, can you help us be a church of people who are following you? We don't want to be anything else. We don't want to be a church of clever people. We don't want to be a church of people that you know, have the right ideas. We don't want to be a church of... It, it, those things are good, but they're not the ultimate thing. Jesus, we want to be a church of people following you. We want you to be Lord of our church and Lord of our lives. I just pray for my brothers and sisters now. Help us see the areas in our own lives where that is currently not true where we're still holding tightly to the steering wheel. We're trying to sort it out on oursel by ourselves without you. Jesus, help us release. Release our, our lives into your hands and know that you are with us, you love us, and your grace invites us into a fantastic future. Thanks for moments like this where we can remember what really matters. Amen.